Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Maine SBDC webinar. My name is Kelsey Reardon, and I'm with the state team hosted by USM right in Portland. And today we are going over how to start a food truck. Uh, and we have Maine SBDC at CEI business advisor Jen Stein with us. Uh, so she comes to us with lots of restaurant and food uh what, what is it called, a commercial kitchen experience. Um, so it really helps in understanding all of that back end stuff that comes with a food truck we were discussing before the call. Uh, so we're excited to have her and have all of you here to learn a little bit more about getting a food truck on the road, so to speak. Um, but if you're not familiar with the main SBDC, we are the Small Business Development Centers, and we are here to help with any small business needs you might have. Uh, and so if we can't answer your question, we can certainly find someone who can. We can't give legal or accounting advice, but we can connect you with a couple of lawyers and a, or a list of accountants and get you connected to the right people. Um, we provide no cost business advising. Uh, so all of our programs are federally funded uh, and, and state funded. So you're already contributing. You should utilize all the resources that you have at your disposal. And we are happy to be one of them. So if you're not already set up with a business advisor, there's a big orange button on our website that says request advising. And that's the fastest way to get into our system. So we have a uh, centers throughout the state and advisors in each center so we can help uh, geographically or industry specific or restaurant versus food truck. We, we have a lot of different expertise throughout the network. So we're happy to get connected with you. Um, after today's presentation, I will send out a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording as well as the slides and any resources we cover. Um, it's likely that that email will go out tomorrow morning, but you'll get all of that very, very soon. Um, included in that email will be all of our contact information, including a link to request advising. So you don't need to go searching for that orange button, but you're welcome to if you can't wait. Uh, if you have any questions at all today, go ahead and stick those in the chat and we'll make sure that they get answered. If not along the way, there'll be plenty of Q&A time at the end, um, but also feel free to email me or Jen, I'll have all of our contact information in those emails. Respond to any email you've ever gotten from me and it will end up in the same place so we can get your questions answered even if they come along later. Um. Otherwise, I think we're all set to get started today, so I will pass it over to Jen. Great. Oh no, we did practice this. I clicked the different one. We <laughs> always say technology is great when it works. When and we got works, on here early. Yes. We practiced pressing the buttons, and this is just part of, all right. part of life. Looks I good. I've got it. Um. Okay, great. So this is, sorry, I'm looking around. Starting a food truck in Maine, Kelsey covered uh, the agenda. Just real quick, um, I do talk fast. So if you need to interrupt me, this is a small enough group. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time um, as we go or put it in the chat um, or we have a Q&A at the end as well. So quick intro, I have gone through the process of doing a food cart, not a truck, um, and it was ready to eat food. So consumer packaged goods, it was not ready to eat consumer packaged goods. I had a jerky cart and that's that um, there on the left. So I've gone through the process. Um, after I did that, I was working on a Fork Food Lab and then I ended up being the general manager at Fork Food Lab. I have business experience beyond the snack cart, but um, I ran the Fork Food Lab for like two and a half years and really focused on um, getting members' goods out and events and ways to expose and give um, extra benefit to being a member there. Um, and then I've been here at SBDC and CEI um, for the last two years. So in CEI, I work a lot on the food systems on that side of things as well. So still kind of have my hands in the food scene. Um, so I want to start with starting a food business as you know, a mobile food truck. It's no different than starting a business. Um, and so you would start with a business plan. Um, so in business plan, we're obviously as business advisors going to promote to do a formal business plan. Um, but if you don't aren't need funding and you just don't think you need it, I would still advise to at least go through 
think about all the things that are in a business plan and make sure you have a good handle on what you think you're going to be doing, the market out there. Um, I think food truck business as an industry is doing very well, but where are you? Is there a market there for what you're doing? All of that sort of thing um, rolls into a business plan. Um, and we are going to send a guide for writing a business plan after this, um, choosing a business entity. Uh, so business entity can be anything from a sole proprietor to an LLC, to a corp. Um, really important with food is there's inherently a little more risk um, than if you were selling like stuffed animals. Um, so thinking about um, at least doing an LLC um, because you do have a higher risk, like someone can say, I got sick, um, that sort of thing. So putting um, a little bit of division between your business and yourself um, would be something smart to do as a business with food. EIM would be your next step, which is just your business social and then um, insurance. So all business, all food businesses will need insurance liability. But as a food truck, there's an extra piece to insurance if you're going to go set up on someone else's business or you're going to be in a festival you have to put that location on your insurance so when you're shopping insurance just make sure that's an easy thing to do to just add someone add a location to your insurance and you're not waiting like a full business day or something like that so if you get an opportunity to do something quickly um, that's just the one kind of difference with a food business or any vendor really you would need to do that but um, keep that in mind when you're shopping insurance um, the flexibility of your plan and then uh, food truck is a pretty broad term. There's lots of mobile businesses. Um, if you do a food trailer, um, that means it's going to be towed. So you'd have another vehicle to tow it. Um, you also normally would leave that and go park your vehicle somewhere else. So there can be pros and cons to that. Pro would be that if you're at a, um, a festival or something, you can also, someone else on your team can be running an errand in the vehicle that you used to get there. Obviously, a food truck wouldn't keep going. Uh, food trailers, the really big ones, um, can also be commissary kitchens sometimes. If they're big enough, they can be considered your kitchen. Um, we'll get a little more into the need of kitchen too, but a food truck um, is just one vehicle. Um, so if some, if your food truck breaks down, you're down, which is one thing, uh, but you drive place to place. It's also easier if you're going somewhere where there's not a lot of parking, that sort of things. Uh, most food trucks do need a commissary kitchen um, or a commercial kitchen. Um, so that they can do their prep and storage there because they're usually smaller. Um, food cart is needs to be pushed or towed as well. Um, some are small enough to go behind bicycles. Um, they still have like the hand washing requirements and stuff. So you have to think about that as you go, but you can do a very small um, cart. You can think of like, if you've been to New York City, there's tons of hot dog stands on like every corner. Those are just carts. They wheel them in by foot um, every morning. So um, it can be small like that. Stick build um, is, I don't know if it's a unique domain term, but that's what we call if you're setting up everything um, for like a farmer's market, you're bringing your table, your tent, you're setting up everything, you have all your food there to serve. Um, that is a different license in Maine and um, but totally a viable option. So you, if you go to farmer's markets, you might see like people serving up different hot foods. Um, and so that's called just a stick build, meaning that you can take it all home with you when you go. Um, and then catering is another Mobile, um, typically you don't have any vehicle requirements there. You're just going to do things like private parties and stuff, but also in being considered a mobile um, food and takes that license. Um, so the considerations when you're trying to decide what type of um, solution works best for you as far as food truck or trailer is what kind of food are you cooking? And so what kind of equipment do you need? The more equipment you need, the bigger space obviously you need. Um, if you need something to be fried, you would need a hood on the truck. So that's another, not all trucks and carts are able to support a hood. So that's a consideration. Um, so really thinking about what um, you're doing. And I would suggest, like, I feel like um, used uh, trucks and everything are great. Obviously, you can refurbish. But I would think about your business first and then the solution to fit so that you don't find limitations um, that really impact your revenue that you can't do that you were hoping to because you got the truck first. Um, um, and the cost for the mobile units can vary um, anywhere from 5000 to 250000 Uh, So they're very vast. So cost would be something else to consider as you're thinking about your menu and what you can afford and what would make sense. Um, staff, when you're thinking about also your food and your menu and what you're going to be serving, how many people would it take to put an order together um, and how many people can fit in the space that you're looking to purchase to do this. So 
Um, staff can be uh, a really tough one if you have a really tight space, but it's just not feasible that one person can do every part of an order. Um, and then locations, uh, where are you hoping to take this mobile? Are you going to go to like festivals where they have designated space? Um, in Portland, there's lots of places like the Eastern Prom where you can park a truck um, and serve foot, where there's natural foot traffic. Um, but thinking about where you want to go and what is parking going to be like um, and how many people do you want to serve? Uh, what would be like if you go to a festival, you're going to have to serve a lot more at once. <laughs> you have lines. And so thinking about that as you're thinking about the space to make the food in as well. Um, and then kitchen needs. So um, it has to be a certain size in storage and also depends on the food you're serving and the risk level. So like low level risk is a bag of chips is a good example. Like no risk to you doing that. You're going to sell it in its package. Um, it doesn't matter what temperature you store it for the most part. Um, and then as you go, if you're going to be serving hamburgers, that's a high risk because it's raw meat that you're cooking there, presumably. If you're going to do chicken wings and you're going to par cook them before you go, that'd be a medium risk because most of the things are killed in that first cook. Um, but thinking about that, so whether if you have a cart, um, a lot of those little push carts, you might need coolers and stuff. Is that acceptable for the kind of food you're uh, serving? Um, and that again goes back to the risk. Um, and then needing a kitchen, uh, if your truck cannot be considered a commissary kitchen or a commercial kitchen on its own, you would need to rent space. Um, or if you have your own space um, that is commercial, you could do that. DHHS uh, does not accept home kitchens like the ag department does. So it's a different licensing. Um, so you do have to have some sort of commercial kitchen, but anywhere that serves, serves food to the public has a license for the most part. So like churches, Masonic halls, Legion halls, all of those um, may already have a license and then you can work out of there as well. You would still need your license um, and they would need to know where you're working, but you wouldn't have to go through licensing a commercial kitchen if it's already licensed. Obviously the other one is uh, commissary kitchens, which is what Fort Food Lab would be considered. Um, I believe there's more opening. There's one in Brunswick now, and I think one's coming in Bangor. But those are actual kitchens set up, and you pay a fee to work out of there. Um, so like at Fork, you pay for access to the kitchen. Food trucks really use it a lot for um, washing their dishes at the end. So you can just pile a lot of your dishes. It takes down the size of a, a tube you might need in the actual uh, food truck. And then also disposing of gray water, which is all the water... If you wash dishes, anything you do on a food truck, you're collecting all of that. It's not attached to anything. So having a place to dump that, a place that is set up for multiple food vendors would have a place for you to dump that. Um, if not, you might be able to use like an RV um, place or something like that, somewhere that has that set up. Um, yeah, I think... Yeah, so mostly if you're anything beyond a food trailer that's just massive, you're probably going to need some sort of kitchen. Um, and with that storage, so the cold and the um, freezer storage that you would need to be able to prep and get out there. Um, so when you're thinking about strategy, I think what are you selling? Seems obvious, right? You're selling food <laughs> when you get out there, you know, selling bottled water or selling something that you don't have to do labor to sell and compliments and your one-stop shop for some of those clients. Um, is a good move? Are you going to do side dishes, just main dishes? Are you doing snacks? Um, all of that kind of thinking and then thinking about the space that you have in a mobile unit. Um, and then who are you selling to? Seems obvious, but is there a market for, and obviously this all goes in your business planning too, um, but is there a market for the kind of niche you're trying to go out there and do? Um, and also how much? So how much can you charge for what you're doing? And does that align with the food costs that go into making it, the labor you need to put it, and will you see a profit? Um, and then where are you selling? So that's the logistics, again, of where are you actually setting up shop? Is there natural inherent food foot traffic there? Um, if not, how will people know? So how will you do marketing? Let people know, create a following, um, and then as you move around, how do people know how to find you if they love you? Um, and really, as a not being a brick and mortar and you're mobile, you're already on the move. Like there's one advantage that people see your truck and they're like, oh, where are they going? And they want to follow it. The disadvantage is if I just loved it last week and I want to go grab it again, I don't know where to find you. So you need to think about how you are telling people how to find you, where to find you and when to find you. And then I, uh, I'm friendly with the Greeks of Creeks. They worked out of uh, Fork Food Lab when I was in. They've gone on 
to have another location on Peaks Island. Um, and my question to them was just when you were thinking about starting this, what was the biggest thing that was a miss for you guys in your first year or two years? Um, and this is what they came back. They think um, the biggest challenge was it's okay to say no. So that goes back to the slide before. It's like, who are you doing this for? Um, don't change your concept because someone wants something different. As you can see from their statement, it didn't make sense financially. Um, so, and then also I think they were stretched pretty thin. I saw it in action in the first few years, but if you really hammer out ahead of time, like who you're making the food for, um, where and all of that, you're not, you don't have to waver from your business plan to please others. Um, and I think with a mobile truck, there's lots of options. Like you can do festivals, um, you can do, you know, organized events, you can do private events like weddings. Um, so really thinking about the mix and what will A, be, you know, the best revenue for your time um, and also how long you need to be there. So a lot of times, um, an obvious partnership would be breweries and food trucks, um, but a lot of times the brewery hours are a lot longer than a food truck A can have inventory for because you only have so much space. So they sell out before the hours um, close on a brewery or they just don't want to be out that long because it's not um, worth going through the lulls of the business day. So thinking about that ahead of time um, so that you can say no when it makes sense is helpful. Um, and then licensing requirements. So um, I alluded to before, um, the ag department in Maine does all consumer packaged goods. So if you're making something, sealing it, putting a label on it, that's the Department of Ag. They do allow um, home kitchen. They inspect your home kitchen and they can approve it for commercial use. Um, that doesn't make it a commercial kitchen in the eyes of DHHS, um, which is the Department of Health and Human Services. They do all ready to eat foods. So that means if I hand you a sandwich, you don't have to do anything to it. It's a ready to eat. If I give you something sealed, it's a dry soup and you have to add water and microwave it. That is not ready to eat. That's packaged goods. So it's two different licenses. Um, if you're doing both, you would need both licenses. So because you have one license, you can't do both sides. You still need to get registered with the other entity. Um, and then Mobile licenses depends on the size of the, uh, the automobile and some other things, but it's 30 to $270 annually for DHHS, less expensive with the ag department. Um, and then kitchen is another, if you do need a kitchen, that would be an additional fee to think about. Um, and then it's usually the eating place mobile is a license that most food trucks would need. Um, and you do it and you enter the main health inspection program. What would happen is you would fill out your license application that goes to Augusta um, and then Augusta sends processes it and then they'll send it to the inspector and then the inspector would give you a call um, and say, when do you want to set this up? If you have the kitchen and um, a vehicle of some sort, they'll probably want to see both. So you'd probably just go to your kitchen with your food truck and get um, inspected for both there. Um, the, again, with the, the inspector, Two things I like to tell people is they're not just going to show up your first time. <laughs> they're going to schedule it with you. Uh, so you're going to be ready when they come. Um, so you're not going to get surprised um, and not be ready. So if you file for your license a little before you actually have everything in place, that's okay. You can just tell them, you know, and stay in their queue and not um, meet with them yet. Um, and also it's not pass or fail. So they may come out and they don't like your, how you have something set up in the truck and they'll say, fix it. I'll come back in a week um, and give you your um license. So it's not pass or fail, but they may give you like a laundry list of things to change. They may come out if you thought your truck was big enough to be considered a kitchen, they may come out and say, no, it's not. Or they may come out and say, yes, it is, which would be great. Um, so they'll come out, but they're not pass or fail. And if you have questions, like if you get a truck and you know it needs some stuff to be able to meet the requirements, it doesn't hurt to talk to an inspector um, and have them talk to you about how they would solve something. Um, they are a really good resource. And in Maine, we're really lucky. They're not trying <laughs> to not pass you. They really want people to go into business for the most part. Or from my experience, I should say, I haven't worked with every inspector in the state, but um, it doesn't help their resource to answer. And I also, after this, we're going to send around, um, they've put together a nice checklist of all the requirements for a mobile um, food unit. Um, so we'll send that around. And also um, a list of definitions about what they, you know, 
approved is even in there that they've approved it. But there's lots of definitions of how they talk and think about um, food businesses, which is helpful. So we're going to send that around as well. Uh, DHHS does also require a serve safe manager certification or something equivalent. So as long as they approve it, even if it's not the serve safe brand, um, it could count. Those are certifications that last for seven years. So if you <laughs> have had it in the past, it's worth digging up and seeing if you still have it. Um, there's multiple places that offer the course. Um, you can sit in and take the course there and there's online options now um, as well. So it is the manager level, not server. Um, and the person who has that has to be on site when the production's done. So in a certain, a in a scenario with a food truck, that person would have to be there for most of the service, if not all, um, if you were making food. So um, it's just good to know. You might want more than one person on the team to have that. Um, and then the commercial kitchen, again, they don't allow home. And I, I don't know when they made that change, um, but it was in the last like five years that they won't, let, they won't allow home used, um, even if the ag department has approved it for commercial. Um, and then the kitchen also like, most units need it. The things you don't think about on a food truck are storage and prep space. So it may seem like the perfect place to put, you know, a hamburger on the grill you have in there and then assemble it. But it might not be a great place if you want to make your hamburger rolls to roll everything out, kind of improve it, um, that sort of stuff. So um, prep is something that is often overlooked when you're looking at the space. Um, and that and storage, um, if you're going out to some like a festival and you have a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you probably don't want to be going and sourcing all the food for the next day, that day or the day of. So um, just for efficiency, having a kitchen where you have storage can be really beneficial um, that you could just do one buy and have everything for the whole weekend ready for you. Um, and then in Maine, there's also municipal level licensing. Um, and I put Portland up there because Portland's one that definitely has it and it's pretty uh, pricey to do business in Portland. Um, but once you have that uh, license in Portland, you can go to places that they have set up that are food truck friendly, like the Eastern Promenade. Um, and some, some towns don't have any additional licensing, um, but some do. So Portland, Lewiston, Freeport, and Rockland are four that I know that have an additional level of licensing required. That is not a complete list for sure. Um, and then, uh, so you have to talk to them and make sure you're meeting their requirements um, and following all of their guidelines. So it, a lot of towns don't, you can just like pull up to an intersection and open up for business. Um, there are certain places you could do that, um, places you can't do that. And so it's really important to check in with the town where you're going to be going to see what they allow and don't allow. Um, and then logistics, I think there's just, I was joking with Kelsey before we started, but there's just a lot of moving pieces literally with a food truck. Um, and so thinking about parking, so parking when you're at an event, parking when you're not open, like where are you going to put uh, this truck or trailer? Um, and then prep space I talked about, but like, where are you prepping if you're doing a big event or something? Like, how do you have room? Like if you need you know, six gallons of coleslaw, where do you store that once it's made? Where do you store the raw ingredients before you make it? Um, and then uh, produce sourcing, where are you going to get your goods? Um, if you're promoting that it's local, making those relationships with people where you can source local stuff um, and you can at the quantities you need is really important. And as you grow, um, thinking about where you would source next, where you can save money sourcing. So another place where a kitchen comes in handy is if you can buy, you know, huge things of salt and all the spices that you use versus buying just enough for what you're doing, then um, that's a drastic example, but you need cold, uh, dry storage to store stuff like that. Um, and then utilities, uh, what gray water disposal, water in general, electricity, um, your garbage at the end of the day, like what are you doing with that? So thinking about all of that, because it isn't like a little ecosystem, it's just a moving mobile. Storage, I think I've hit on that a lot, but um, it's something a lot of people do miss starting out, um, just thinking about like what the, what you need at each stage of your food process uh, before it gets to the consumer. Uh, thinking about the customer service and flow. Um, so how are you taking orders and then who, how do you have to staff that? Um, nobody wants just a bottleneck of a line in front of a food truck. So do you need someone outside the truck that's helping with that? 
um, that sort of thing. And it, of course, in vain, you know, there's going to be rainy days. Like, how do you deal with that? Do you offer some sort of shelter? Um, are there, you know, what do you do with people that are waiting? Thinking about all of that. Um, also something to think about before you actually get the vehicle, because if you have, you know, if you have something that's going to come up at three separate times, you want to make sure you have a nice long window versus if you can just give someone something on their whole order on a tray um, would be a different flow for customers. Uh, and then thinking about POS, what kind of payment are you, that's point of sale, but what kind of payment are you accepting and how are you doing that? Um, another thing that piggybacks with that is sales tax. So there may be different sales tax on different items that you're selling. Bag of chips might be one thing, ready to eat might be another. Um, so thinking about all that. And then your schedule. So scheduling the thing, it's really um, different with a food truck because after you're all ready to go, you still have to get to location. So thinking about what time you really need to start prepping and how many people you need to be doing that to get places on time. Um, Thompson's Point is a great example for their concerts. Uh, you pay to be there. And if you're not there on time, they don't let you in. So there's a lot of a lot of pieces like that. Um, great when you do a concert, but other thing is if it rains. But um, yeah, so thinking about your schedule and how it makes sense. And if, you know, before you commit to all the things you want to do, making sure it's feasible and you can get the truck physically there as well as full of food. Um, weather in Maine, again, weather, but with a food truck, uh, not just like, do you go out if it's pouring rain, but also do you have the right tires to carry the truck in the pouring rain? Are you, there's a lot of trucks out there that aren't highway savvy. <laughs> so, you know, depending on where you're going to go, uh, does the truck or mobile that you um, have, is it able? So if you can't go on the highway, obviously you would need to do much more local than if you can go on the highway, can't go on the highway, but there's other ways like route one to get there still you need to all allocate that time to get there. So there's a lot more kind of things with weather that matter more with a food truck. Um, and then marketing, that goes back to the, how will people know where you are, but how are you marketing, branding and promoting yourself? You know, private events can be a great um, gig for food trucks because you know how many people, there's no food waste. Um, so you get there. So like, if that's what you want to do, how would you reach the people planning those. Um, if you just want to go out in the street, how do you, you know, market where you are so people can find you? There's also some apps out there that track where food trucks are. Um, there's a lot of food bloggers in Maine that have a really robust following. So getting on their radar, um, that sort of stuff for marketing is important. Um, festivals and events um, kind of ties in with marketing and scheduling, but most festivals, even farmers markets, you have to sign up well in advance of the event actually happening. So planning your events for an entire year or at least the summer um, is really helpful. So you may not get in every festival your first year, um, but knowing what they are, um, you can also on most festival sites, um, go to the vendor part and see how many people they expect each year and that sort of thing. And that can help you plan. Is it feasible for you to really service that crowd? Um, before you commit and then you're stuck in a festival with your sold out sign. Um, and then winter in general, I mean, is a huge piece. Um, so obviously food trucks, we think of summer and outdoor, um, but if some are winterized and if that's important to your business plan to be year round, um, thinking about that before you purchase again. Um, and then a lot of food trucks, there is a piece and I'm not going to be able to answer more questions on that, but there's a piece where things can freeze and everything breaks. Um, so if it's not winterized, thinking about storage and making sure that that storage is the right temperature and that you drain your truck um, and do everything so that it's ready to go uh, when you're back from where we spend the winter. Um, so that is everything I had in slides and I'm sure it wasn't a full hour. Um, so questions. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer what I can. Um, and that's the long list of resources we'll be sending out after as well. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, and thank you to everybody who has joined us so far. Um, feel free to stick any questions you have in the chat. Um, also, this is a pretty small group. So if you want to just unmute yourself, that's okay too. Um, what Jen would you say is like the, the first thing that they should do if they're interested in, in opening a food truck? I think the first thing is to hammer out your menu, what you really want to make, um, because the, 
the you know whatever you buy for equipment needs to accommodate that. Um, so hammering out your menu and then finding out you know do you think there's enough people in the area where you are that would want that? Is there enough opportunity to park the truck or mobile um, various places? But I think the menu is the first thing for all food businesses really. Uh, but knowing, and then when you're looking at equipment, does it work and like how big of a space will you need? And does your menu make sense for mobile? Um, there's just a lot of moving pieces. So if you wanted to do something that takes a ton of fresh produce and you're not gonna be able to have the refrigerator storage, it wouldn't make sense maybe being mobile. Um, so answering those questions first about the menu, I think is the first piece. That's that makes a lot of sense. I don't know why that isn't the first thing that I thought of. I feel like, you know, like the menu is like you'll get to the menu eventually, but I never thought about like the equipment, like how tall is your truck? Like how can you fit those things? So great advice. Um segue yeah, from your requirements too. So I mentioned it briefly, but if you're gonna be frying something, you need a hood. So you have to have a vehicle that's large enough for a hood. Frying is the big one. So fried food has a great um profit margin as a rule. But if you can't, if, if you're banking on that and you're going to do other expensive stuff that doesn't, then, um, you know, you need to make sure you get the right equipment at the get-go. I also only recently learned the importance of a hood. So just <laughs> great advice all around. Um, what you're saying about the refrigeration, uh, Tina's asking, if you have a membership with food, Fork Food, do you have access to dry and refrigeration storage? Yes. So, um I will start with, I don't work there any longer, so <laughs> I can only speak to what it was a couple of years ago. But yes, you had access to cold freezer and dry storage, and you could pay more for more shelves as you went. Um, and I will say that was the number one, number one thing I saw with food businesses across the board is they would come in for their tour and they would say, oh, I don't think I need any storage. And then after they had been working like one or two shifts, they'd come and add like three shelves to their membership because the convenience of not having to move everything with you um is really you know key for efficiency and i would think all i think that's the difference between a commercial kitchen like um just getting in a church or something that's set up for that and a commissary would be that they're gonna offer everything um probably for a price but everything that you would need to uh, um would be a different entity in that space I was going to say, is that sort of standard with commercial kitchens that there's some sort of storage included or, or there's a payment, there's a, you know, payment option for that? Yep. So commissaries are kitchens that are set up to have multiple food businesses in them. And they, as the standard would be that you have access to all that um, and some services. So like at Fork Food Lab, uh, you could have all your deliveries made when you weren't there. So like the staff there would take take the order from like say native Maine who sells and then they would take it and put it on your shelf for you. So that saves a lot of time too that you don't have to be in person somewhere. So a commissary is set up um, to help people build their business, like and make it easier for people to do business as well with all these shared resources. Whereas like if you just went and asked someone, so you can also moonlight a kitchen. So like if you found a bakery who's closed at two and you could use their their kitchen um, and do night service from your food truck, something like that um, is also, that'd be okay legally from the department's um, point of view, but you know, it might be difficult because they probably don't have a lot of extra storage or they, so you might have to pack up everything. Um, and that's the thing, another thing to think about with risk and food risk and the way the inspectors look at it is low risk. They're not gonna be really concerned if you're taking that home with you every night or leaving on the truck. Um, something like raw meat or fish um, becomes a really high concern, dairy, um, things that can cause food illnesses, um, anything like that. So if you have a base that has ample storage, you're not going to have to show how you're measuring and you know, taking temperatures and you wouldn't need us, you know, I don't think you'd need a HACCP plan either way, but um, a plan for all the risks to the food. That's interesting. I had in also hadn't considered like sharing kitchen. So if you had some sort of agreement with an established kitchen, then all of those certifications would also apply. Yeah. So or if you can, you, you can use a kitchen that's already licensed, but you need your own license to operate in there. So you wouldn't be able to just be like, oh, they're a business, so I can do business there. You still need, um, 
your business license to anyone who sells food in Maine period needs some sort of business license. So you would right. still need that. Um, the difference would be that they wouldn't be going through um, and taking the temperature of the water, say. So an inspector will do all of that on a new entity, take, make sure the temperature of the water is right for washing dishes, make sure, you know, where's the trash going, the dumpster's in the right place. Like they'll, they'll really be nitty gritty on a brand new place. So you skip all that. That would be great. Um, <laughs> but that goes into what you were saying about having to add that address, right? The... Like I guess earlier you were talking about when whatever location for insurance, you were talking about insurance. Oh, having, yep. So that would still, you would just have to apply based on the address of the other business. Um, you would use that address. So wherever you're actually doing the prep um, and that again, if it's in your, if it's all in your mobile entity um, where you can do everything start to finish, that's, that's, the address so you would use your home address or whatever one your license but um if you need a kitchen they would want an the inspector needs to know where you're actually planning to do all of that prep work um and again if it if it is say for food lab that's well known and has they have 45 food members not all dhhs software ag department some of both <laughs> uh but you they you could easily uh, the more concerning thing would be your your mobile unit for them in that scenario because they know the kitchen. So there'd be no harm if you're worried about your mobile to apply. And then um, say you want to work at a fork, what do you have to do for the mobile piece? And then they'll tell you, and then you can go sign your membership with fork and then call them in for the inspection. But um, I, I like really want to enforce that the inspectors aren't the bad guys. They are really helpful usually um, in the situation. Like they'll just tell you what you need to fix um, to get it up to code. Uh, a lot of times when people are doing a build out, I like have them talk to the inspector. If they like what you're doing, they might just have a really easy suggestion um, that you just didn't know about. Uh, she'll make it a lot easier to pass inspection or keep it clean and keep passing. Yes, we, they're just trying to keep everybody safe. And <laughs> so you want to, you also want to keep everyone safe. So working together is a great, that's a great team. Yeah. And I mean, there is risk with food um, always because people can get sick and stuff. So understanding the serve safe manager um, course really walks you through like what temperature things need to be to stay safe. So, um, and what temperature they need to be cooked and that sort of thing and how to store, how to store things um, so that you're not chancing any contamination. So that's why they require that too. You may have mentioned this already, uh, but when, who has to have the serve safe certification? Is it the owner? Is it a manager on, on, within staff? Like who's responsible for that when it comes to the cart or the truck? The person with the certificate for the most part has to be there when the food's being made. And that okay. includes so prep. Whoever it is has to be there. It can be more than one person though. You can right. have a team of four people that all have it. Yeah. That seems like a better strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked in kitchens where there's like just the manager has it. And that's, that can be tricky. Yeah. So um, you're, that's kind of new with DHHS. I feel like they did the no home kitchens and the serve safe requirement kind of at the same time. Um, so yeah, so ag department doesn't require that, but it's useful to do even if you're on the ag side, because they may require it later. Okay. Uh, Northeast Lobster is asking, could you describe the difference between a truck needing a commissary kitchen and one that doesn't? Yep. So um, it's prep space and storage is usually the big things. Um, so if you can say you can do everything in your food truck start to finish and also store everything you need for however long you're doing it and the inspector agrees with you, you would not need a commercial or a commissary. Um, that said, you also like it could be that they don't, you don't have enough space to wash. So if you have a uh, two bay sink, the has to be able to submerge your biggest piece of equipment. So if you have a blender that's too tall for your two-bay sink that you have to use to make smoothies on the food truck, you would then need a kitchen that has a dishwasher or larger three bays that you can say, that's where I actually clean that at the end of the day. Blender is a really bad example because you'd be doing multiple things in it. But I'm just saying like something that you need that's too big for uh, um, the sinks on the truck. If there's any piece of equipment that's vital to what you're doing, you would, or like your grates of your grill could be a good example. You're not going to be able to fit those probably in the sink on the truck. Does that answer? Yeah, they said, thank you very much. And it, again, it, like, 
I wouldn't have thought of the grates of a grill. <laughs> it's so, all you know, like, I just like scrape the them off a little bit, but I don't own a restaurant or a food truck, luckily. <laughs> awesome. I don't see any other questions, but um, if anybody's got one, feel free. Plug it in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, this was great. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, like she said, all of those resources will be included in my follow-up email. So uh, that will, it'll see how long uh, it takes for the video to process. I might be able to get it out this afternoon, um, but my follow-up email will include the recording and the slides and uh, it was like a business planning guide. There was a couple other things. Um, so they'll all be included. Yeah. So, and that's the other thing I'll say, DHHS does, the two of the resources we're sending are straight from DHHS, so you can take them at their word, which is great. Um, and then the one other caveat I would say is things do change. So, like, you know, I would say the inspector is always the best person to go to for questions. I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, if I can, but the inspector is your best bet because they're going to know the latest and greatest um, for the food loss and what they're following. And the inspectors with the DHHS, Jen? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So DHHS would be all ready to eat. Unless like, so my example of my snack cart, I was doing beef jerky and it was all packaged and labeled at Fork Food Lab. So I went to the ag department and that's all I ever needed because I never served, you know, no one wants jerky hot. So <laughs> I didn't have, to, didn't have to worry about that, but I wasn't serving any ready to eat. So I was all ag department. Um, because so it was all prepared off crop off property, so to speak. Yep. So if you're sealing it in the kitchen, mm -hmm. um, you can then, you don't need to ha um, have the DHHS license. Mm -hmm. The exception is Portland. Uh, Portland still requires you to have the city license, which is coupled with the DHHS. It's always so confusing to me. I always forget which one. <laughs> it's confusing. Uh, yeah. Basically, if you can just take it from the person handing it to you and bite into it, it's ready to eat. And if it's, if it's packed, if you have to open it, that'd be consumer packaged goods, um, which means ag. Got it. This was really helpful. Thank you so much. Sure. Hey, Jen, I have, I have a question about the Portland, uh, South Portland Lewiston application, um, which is, I know, super confusing, but I just want to check to make sure I understand it. Um, my understanding is that the state has an application that says Portland, South Portland, Lewiston on it. And you use that application because it's cheaper than the right, the bigger state application. And they made it less expensive because you also need to get one from one of those cities. But that if you use that application from the state, it means you cannot have your truck in any other place other than those locations. Is Am I correct about that? That's interesting. So, when I was at Fork, you had to go through DHHS normal, um, and then you had to go through Portland, and you had to pay an extra 500 and something dollar fee. They call it the food service establishment fee. Right. And I was constantly arguing with the town about it, but losing. Um, so you had to go get that second one, and there might have been enough complaining because the, the one for the whole state is $270, so even an additional 500 Um so I don't know if they knock that down, but if you get the DHHS one, you're good for the whole state, but you still would have to, like, you're doing something in a town, um, like if you were doing a wedding or something, you might have to get an event uh, from the town, an event permit for that one day, um, just town by town, but um, I don't know about the new... Yeah, the, so the state has an application, so the state, not the cities, have it, has an application that has Portland, South Portland, Lewiston on that application, and okay. it's less expensive than the regular state-wide application. Um, you still have to go to Portland, South Portland, Lewiston, get your additional license, but but it's it's hard to understand what that specific license from the state is doing for you. It, it's um, and I thought it was because they wanted to make it cheaper because of the issue you just talked about. Uh, but that it, because it was cheaper, you didn't actually have the ability to be anywhere in the state. Um, you had to stick to those cities with that state application. That's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Um, I saw that when I was putting together my slides uh, that they had a separate application. Um, I also didn't realize South Portland was included because South Portland used to not have the same extra yeah. fee. 
it's really confusing. It's also confusing to it, it, what, about whether if you fill out that application, does a state inspector come and then you also get inspected by the city? So in Portland, it's the same inspector. They're okay. DHHS and the city of Portland. Okay. Um, so it's just one inspection. Um, and it's the same process that you have to do the two applications, or it was, but it was one entity that did the actual um, inspection, which is what I also made it a little confusing because the town was saying certain things and then they weren't always aligned. Um, but Tom Williams is the Portland um, inspector. I don't know if he's South Portland too, um, but he's one of the Portland ones and he's really good about explaining this. So I can send you his contact. Okay. That'd be um, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. He's very, I mean, Thanks. don't tell him I gave it to you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I, that just goes to show if you're confused, you're not alone. This was a series of Main SBDC advisors who have all joined this webinar to learn more about it because it can be tricky. So we're all here to help. And that points to how they're changing things a lot. They do change things. So what I tell you today could be different tomorrow. So that's why I'm always like, go to the source as far as that, um, especially as inspections go, if you're doing any sort of build out, it just makes sense to ask and make sure it's good before you spend the money. Yep. And that's a good point. We try and put the date of the recording of each webinar in the YouTube description for that reason exactly. Um, so we are always trying to keep things updated, but things change faster than we want them to constantly. So uh, definitely getting set up with a business advisor so that you can have these more like timely conversations if things are changing um, is a great resource to have on your team. So uh, if you're not already set up with a business advisor, we highly, highly, highly recommend it. I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I think we'll wrap up for today, but thank you so much, Jen. Thank you to everyone who came and joined. Uh, I feel like I learned <laughs> a bunch. So I have no interest in starting a food truck, but I will definitely come <laughs> eat your snacks. So I'm let sure us know much. when you open up. <laughs> Great. Otherwise, I think we're all set. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone.